All right, so we have molten liquid magma material underground or lava above ground. When this stuff melt or uh, melts, when this stuff cools and solidifies, it forms rocks. Depending on where this cools on the surface, cooled lava, or below ground, cool magma, it actually forms different rocks. So let's investigate, shall we? Igneous rocks. So think igneous, ignite, born of fire. <clears throat> So when, um, when magma or lava cools down, a process called crystallization begins, whereby mineral grains form and grow in the cooling magma or lava. Um, so imagine, you know, an analogy somewhat. You take water, which is warm, and you cool it down, and it begins to form ice crystals and ice cubes. Well, same thing here. You take magma, but in this case, it's mixed with a bunch of different stuff. All these different minerals that have been melted into this one thing you cool it down as it begins to cool down the different mineral grains will start to kind of find each other and grow individually until everything cools down and you're you're um, left with just a big mix of different mineral grains kind of fused together in a igneous rock <clears throat> so as magma or lava is doing that that's what creates these rocks as magma or lava is cooling down the process is called crystallization now how fast that magma or lava cools uh which is known as the rate of cooling so how fast it or slow it cools down determines the texture of the igneous rock what i mean by that if uh molten material cools very very quickly as in when lava reaches the surface it will cool very quickly. It's much colder on the surface of the earth, much warmer interior earth. So if lava makes it to the surface, it cools, you know, relatively quick. You're not giving a lot of time for crystals to begin to, to form bigger and bigger. So everything cools very quickly. So any crystals that form in there are very small. It might not even be visible to the naked eye. You might have to look under at it with a magnifying glass or under a microscope. You can then pick out the little individual mineral, mineral grains that have cooled and formed, but you can't see it with your naked eye. However, if magma cools below ground where it's much warmer, well, as that cools down, it, it takes longer. It's a little bit warmer, so it takes longer to cool down. So mineral grains, as they start to form, can grow a little bit bigger. Again, take some water, take a cup of water, put it in the freezer for an hour, you take it out, you're only going to get a little bit of crystal in there, little tiny baby ice crystals. You put water in the freezer for a day and you take it out and you're going to get bigger, big chunk of ice, a big ice crystal. Again, kind of the same thing here. If you're cooling it down for a long period of time, if it's going to take longer, so you're going to get bigger crystal growth. If you're cooling things down very quickly, you're going to get small uh, crystal growth. So you can get this, take the same type of magma, basaltic magma, and it, uh, if it cools underground or it cools above ground, you get different textures, and which actually gives you different igneous rocks. So when we're talking about small crystals, in igneous rocks, these indicate that these cooled at very uh, close to or on the surface of Earth. We get something called aphanitic texture. It's derived from a Latin word, fanner being visible, a meaning not. So these are igneous rocks that don't have visible crystals. I can't see them with my naked eye. For instance, if you look at me in my little window down here, um, so this is an igneous rock. It's actually a form of granite, and you can see the different minerals. There's some white, uh, excuse me. There's some black stuff. There's some white stuff. There's some pink, pink stuff over here. More white stuff. More black stuff. So you can see these different minerals that formed as this magma was cooling to form this. This rhyolitic magma was forming, uh, or cooling to form this granite rock. In any case. So that, that is not what I'm talking about. So these are, those are visible crystals. In aphanitic texture, you can't pick out the different mineral grains very easily with your um, naked eye. These type of igneous rocks indicate volcanic activity and are known as an extrusive igneous rock. They formed because this molten material exited the Earth's uh, interior onto the surface. They, again, crystallize very rapidly on or near the Earth's surface because they 
It's colder, so they cool very quickly. So you only get small crystals, and again, not distinguishable to the naked eye, the individual different crystals of mineral grains. You need magnification. Extrusive igneous rocks, uh, some examples are things like basalt, andesite, and rhyolite. Basaltic magma, when it becomes lava, it turns into, uh, or when, it, when lava cools, it turns to basalt. Rhyolitic magma, if it erupts, now it's lava, when it cools, it becomes rhyolite rock. So we're talking about these here. So you can't necessarily easily see the different mineral grades, as if you, you could here. You can see the different black and white and red, black and white. That's not what we're talking about with aphanitic extrusive igneous rocks. They're very fine grain. You might be able to pick out a, a little bit here and there, but under magnification, you would need to pick out the actual individual different mineral grains. These are extrusive igneous rocks formed from cooled lava. Phaneritic texture, phaner meaning visible, these are plutonic igneous rocks. They're intrusive, meaning they formed inside the earth, meaning uh, they crystallize very slowly below low earth surface, forming large crystals. And you can see individual crystals with the naked eye. These form from cooled magma below ground, where this magma cools slowly, can form bigger crystals. You can pick out the different mineral grains. Examples of intrusive igneous rocks include gabbro, diorite, and granite. So again, from a magma body cooling inside the earth, an intrusive rock, again, gabbro or granite. <clears throat> so what's interesting, for instance, uh, granite and rhyolite. So rhyolite is aphanitic. Granite is phaneritic. You can see the different mineral crystal grains. Aphanitic, rhyolite, you can't really see them. However, these two things are made up of the exact same stuff. They're both made up of rhyolitic magma. It's just if it cools underground, it forms bigger crystals and this phaneritic texture and makes granite. If rhyolitic magma erupts to the surface and the lava cools, it forms this very small crystalline aphanitic igneous rock known as rhyolite. They're both made up of the same exact thing. It's just one cooled below ground slowly, one cooled above ground very quickly. Now, sometimes you can get a mix between the two. Maybe the magma started to cool underground and it stopped for some reason, then all of a sudden got pushed up and you get kind of a mix between the two. You get a rock that has both bigger crystals and smaller crystals, and that, ha and that is referred to as porphyritic texture, both intrusive and extrusive characteristics. So it goes through two phases of cooling. Again, initially beginning to cool underground, and then for some reason, uh, magma is given another push, and it kind of comes outward as lava, and the rest of it cools, forming smaller crystalline material. So you get a mix between the two. So again, these are really distinguished by a difference in the size of the crystals, some big, some small. Uh, some examples of porphyritic rocks are andesite porphyry and rhyolite porphyry. Uh, again, kind of initially cooled below ground, but then was pushed above ground. All of these rocks tell a story. <coughs> so when I pick up, if I'm out hiking and I pick up granite, so granite is an igneous rock, so it's formed from cooled magma. But it also forms below ground. So if I'm out walking around and I pick up granite, well, that's a story. Because, wait a minute, this formed underground, and now it's above ground. Huh, how'd it get here? Plate tectonics must have shifted things around, shifted something up to expose this granite. Now I have this big chunk of granite in my hand. It tells a story. Or if I'm looking at basalt, very fine grain. Wait a minute, if I'm picking this up on the surface, this is cooled lava. Basalt is an igneous rock with an aphanitic texture, meaning molten material is at Earth's surface and cooled very quickly. That means this is lava that I'm walking on. Therefore, oh my goodness, there's volcanoes in the area. There's a lot of basalt around the Phoenix area, meaning, guess what? There were volcanoes in the area. Good times. Anyway, here's an example of andesite porphyry, rhyolite porphyry. Again, you see big crystals and then the smaller grain matrix. Again, bigger crystals and then the smaller grain matrix. Before I move on, let me give you part of the super secret code. It is the number nine. You got me? The number nine. One more time. The number nine. 
Some more igneous rock textures, a glassy texture. It's when lava is quenched so quickly, cooled so rapidly that crystallization cannot occur. The result is a natural, what's known as an amorphous glass with few or no crystals. There was no time for the stuff to cool, to find and form crystals. It just all cooled as one cohesive unit, and that typically makes an extrusive igneous rock called obsidian. We also get vesicular texture in igneous rocks. What they show us is that there's uh, little air pockets, little air bubbles that were kind of uh, trapped in the molten rock at the time of solidi uh, solidification, also associated with very quick cooling, meaning this material was blown out of a volcano and it was blown up so high that the material cooled in the air, all the air bubbles kind of bubbled out. So you get this igneous rock with a bunch of little air pockets that shows that it's cooled very quickly, therefore it's cooled lava. And typically when you see those air pockets, there was a lot of gas in that material, so it was blown out of a volcano typically. So it indicates that a very, ex uh, could, uh, could indicate a very explosive volcanic activity. Some examples of extrusive igneous rocks that are vesicular in texture include pumice and scoria. So glassy texture, obsidian is very glass-like. It's sharp like glass, it'll cut you like glass, it looks like glass. It's essentially the same thing as how glass is made. And then vesicular nature has little air pockets, little air bubbles. This is just an example of pumice. Uh, scoria has vesicles, little air pockets. There's also vesicular basalt. So you take all these different textures, aphanitic, phanaritic, uh, porphyritic, glassy, um, and uh, vesicular, and they all tell a story. You know, rocks to me, the, the beauty of them is that they tell a story. And then you can s further subdivide them to further that story. And it goes back to some of those terms that I mentioned earlier, felsic, intermediate, and mafic. An igneous rock that's felsic is generally richer in silicate minerals that contain lighter color elements, silicon, oxygen, aluminum, sodium, potassium. Therefore, the uh, felsic igneous rock is typically lighter in color. Whites, pinks, orangish colors. So it indicates uh, composition, felt like what it's made out of, felsic material. Lighter colored minerals typically are also lighter in weight, which is kind of how it worked out. And so this shows you that it's coming from a little bit closer to the crust. Because when we get into mafic igneous rocks, these are not rich in silicate minerals like quartz. So they formed further down, down in the upper parts of the mantle, contain heavier elements, magnesium, iron, and calcium that are just dark in nature. So mafic igneous rocks are also dark in color. And intermediate igneous rocks are just kind of in between the two. So the color of an igneous rock also tells us the chemical composition. So we can be talking about a mafic aphanitic rock or a felsic um, phanaritic rock <coughs> or an intermediate uh, porphyritic rock. So we can, we can tie composition, which is just based on color, Felsic lighter in color, mafic darker in color, intermediate between the two. So it tells us composition, which and also where it forms. Felsic crust, mafic upper mantle, intermediate between the two. And then couple that with the texture, big crystals, small crystals, glass, holes, um, a mix of big and small crystals, will also further tell us how it formed, or how the how the rock, how the molten material cooled. So we can figure out where the magma is coming from, and we can also figure out where that molten rock cooled, below ground or above ground. So it tells a story. It all tells a story. Furthermore, um, as magma cools below ground, it can form different um, structures. Batholiths are big chunks of magma that cool below ground. Stocks, a little bit smaller. Lacoliths are mushroom-shaped uh, cooled magma pockets. Dikes are just kind of vertical magma intrusions. Sills are horizontal magma intrusions. So we see these in nature as we look at rock faces, as we look at stratigraphic sequences, <coughs> and we can tell when these things occurred. Magma makes its way uh, any way it can. Sometimes it cuts through things. Sometimes it just kind of bubbles up altogether. Sometimes it goes horizontal. Sometimes it goes vertical. And sometimes it cools. 
But in any case, let's go ahead and pause here. When we come back, we're going to talk about some of the hazards that volcanoes present. Spoiler alert, that's a lot. See you in a second.